So the uh, project that we've probably talked the most about is what we like to call the ultra-safe human cell line. And the basic idea is to design a cellular genome for safety at multiple levels. And we envision that such a cell line or cell lines could be used in biotechnology uh, and in stem cell therapies. And, and I, I should also point out that uh, Farron Isaacs was uh, supposed to give the second half of this talk, and uh, I have incorporated an abbreviated version of his second half into my talk, so you won't be hearing from him, but this represents uh, both of our work. Um, <clears throat> so the, the genome, uh, as you probably know, is uh, mostly DNA that does not encode proteins, and this tiny sliver here is about 2 percent of the genome, roughly, 1 to 2 percent. Um, to put it in perspective, that's still the equivalent of three to five of these yeast genomes, which we're, we're still, you know, just over halfway of assembling those at this point. Um, but an interesting uh, aspect of this is because it's split up into these very small pieces. To do this kind of engineering, you don't actually need to have the capability to make giant DNAs. You can work with uh, relatively garden variety size pieces of DNA that are manipulated in labs every day. Um, <clears throat> so really, this is a project that, you know, once certain decisions were made about design, which probably would take a while, uh, you could literally start on this tomorrow. Um, now, the idea would be to engineer in to such a cell line many features aimed at making those cells safe. And just to reiterate something I said before, we would envision doing this in something like uh, an IPS cell line uh, that had a, a germline uh, firewall in it. Uh, to ensure that these would be used for somatic applications only. Uh, so for biotechnology, um, the products made would be less risky. Uh, for example, as you just heard from George, it is possible to engineer at least a bacterial genome for virus resistant. And so a major uh, uh, effort here would be to make a human cell line that was unable to support the growth of viruses and hence uh, should never get contaminated by viruses. And then the other major application would be in stem cell therapies. These are still, of course, themselves rather early in the game. But the idea would be to re-engineer those cells so that they would have a much reduced risk of themselves giving rise to a cancerous derivative. Uh, producing prions and other undesirable uh, traits. And we believe through engineering uh, that could be accomplished. So let me give you an example. Uh, there are at least 35 well-defined tumor suppressor genes and many, many other proposed tumor suppressor genes in our genome that help keep cancer in check. And the idea would be to case harden these genes against mutation in various ways. A famous uh, tumor suppressor gene is the P53 gene, uh, so called guardian of the genome. And what you see here is a map of the mutations that arise in human cancer. And what you can see, first of all, is that almost all of the mutations are in this one part of the gene. And they're extremely variable. There are some spots that are off the scale here. So these are the hot spots. Uh, and then there are others that are much less frequently mutated. And <clears throat> the mechanism, well, first, the, the impact is, is huge in that P53 is mutated in 50 percent of human cancers, and therefore, by implication, one could, if, if one never had mutations in P53, one would anticipate a major impact on the probability of cancer. And most of these mutations occur in these hot spots. Now, of those nine hot spots, 
Seven fall in codons that contain the CG dinucleotide, or CPG, as it's sometimes called. Now, all of those uh, codons could be recoded to other codons that didn't contain a CG, would still specify the same amino acid, and should therefore lose their ability uh, to be hotspots for mutation. Now, this is a somewhat specialized case because p53 is unusual in having a lot of point mutations. Many tumor suppressor genes are lost by deletion or uh, other loss of function. And an inspiration from nature is that some very long-lived animals have extra copies of these tumor suppressor genes. So potentially adding extra copies of some of these tumor suppressor genes uh, might uh, be another way to improve the cancer resistance of these cell lines. Um, <clears throat> my own career started in studying transposable elements, which are parts of uh, virtually all genomes. And you see some pie charts here um, that uh, show the composition of various genomes on the planet. And the orange is the non-transposon component, and the other colors are the mobile DNAs or transposons that have the capability to jump around and insert into genes and cause mutation. And it's recently been shown that uh, these elements actually jump in a somewhat uncontrolled way in the genome of stem cells, um, ES cells in particular. And since um, many therapies are uh, in, in the works uh, using these cells, uh, this is an important uh, thing to be aware of and potentially something that can be engineered out. Uh, our our uh, recent work from uh, George's lab has shown that it is possible to do this with a, uh, at least with a limited uh, number of elements. And through synthesis, I think this could be done in a very uh, comprehensive, uh, elegant, and precise way. There are about 100 active so-called retrotransposons in our genome, in the average human genome, and uh, these could be precisely removed from a stem cell genome, preventing such instability, and it is a uh, direct descendant of one of the components of the synthetic yeast genome that you just heard about, where we've also removed these active elements. So these are two examples of changes that could be made. Um, other genome modifications uh, could be added for free, if you like, uh, at the same time. So uh, George mentioned this idea of sort of a, a baseline genome, which would uh, contain the ancestral alleles uh, uh, of genes. So in, in this particular pilot, we're talking about the coding region only. So there are uh, uh, something like 10,000 of these on average. Um, uh, non-synonymous uh, variants in every coding gene, in every human genome, and we could infer which of those was ancestral in most cases, and, um, and thereby make a kind of baseline human genome, if you will. And this would then allow a very clean way to assess the impact of any individual coding variant uh, on that background. And then these, of course, could be systematically tested. And secondly, uh, it would be possible, uh, whether or not it would be wise would be a matter for debate, but uh, it would be possible to include a genome scrambling system, which um, some of us believe would uh, be a very uh, useful tool for learning more about the human genome. And then the, the major uh, uh, thing that we would be doing is to try to engineer virus resistant. You already heard George mention this. Uh, here are some of the people who've been involved in doing this in, in E. coli. And the basic idea here is by eliminating some specific triplets from the genetic code genome-wide, um, it should subsequently be possible to eliminate otherwise essential components of the translation machinery that reads this code. 
And since all viruses depend in an absolute way on translation, uh, this would be a very effective way to eliminate their re replicative potential. And this is certainly one of the ideas that really gal galvanized me to think this is a really um, practically useful uh, engineering of the human genome that uh, I think justifies certainly doing this pilot. So viruses and cells share uh, the same genetic code, and this is something that that allows for horizontal gene transfer. And horizontal gene transfer, uh, we know from, from the study of genomes, has been pervasive uh, both among the bacteria and from the bacteria to the eukaryotes, so our mitochondria and the chloroplasts of plants uh, were transferred into our genomes or into our cells uh, via these horizontal transfer events. And so um, a, a, a benefit of this kind of code engineering is that it's a way to block this. And uh, of course, we've specifically been talking about uh, virus infection. And, and the practical impact of this is actually quite significant. Um, I just realized when I was preparing for this that <clears throat> I took the polio vaccine when I was a kid. I didn't, ask, I didn't know about Salk and Sabin, so I didn't ask my mom which one I got. But I almost certainly took the, uh, the vaccine that was contaminated with the monkey virus, SV40, uh, along with millions of other people around the world. Now, fortunately, there's no evidence that the SV40 did us any harm except maybe gave some of us crazy ideas, I don't know. Um, but uh, this is uh, a kind of contamination that would not have happened uh, had there been such a cell line around. More recently, um, uh, there have been some pretty big disasters in industry uh, that led to uh, contamination uh, of, of uh, drugs uh, made, made with uh, cells. Uh, by uh, VC virus, and it shut down an entire plant and led to a lawsuit and so on. So we hope that this project might be uh, useful to industry uh, by developing lines that would, would never have this liability of being infectable by a virus. And then, as I said, there's a larger issue of horizontal gene transfer. Um, where uh, it's obviously on people's mind with regard to recombinant uh, DNA in general and applications of it in the field. And <clears throat> so in addition to engineering virus res resistance and generating uh, s stable cell lines for uh, manufacturing of biologics, uh, there are lots of other interesting uh, ideas that can be applied. Uh, in terms of new kinds of therapeutics that would be enabled by a modified uh, translation system, and this idea of safeguarding and biocontaining the cells. So um, exactly how this is going to be done, uh, details remain to be worked out, but it will probably uh, be done by deleting one or two codons from the code. and substituting them with synonymous codons, and then deleting the tRNAs that recognize those particular codons, again, pervasively genome-wide. So these are the open questions. Uh, which codons should we target? Uh, how do we check to make sure that those code changes don't cause problems? And uh, at what parallelization, uh, et cetera, et cetera? With that, I'll welcome some questions on this pilot. Jeff, so you talked about getting rid of the, either the Y chromosome or the X chromosome for, for these cells as a safety measure. And of course, actually, you can differentiate stem cells into meiotic lineages. And I think you could actually get a gamete out of that. Um, in your desire to, to sort of um, tease apart 
various parts of chromosomes, it'll be really important and helpful for you to have lines that have deletions and inversions anyway, mm. especially as you go in and try to make these point mutations at all your ORFs. Um, and given that, uh, if one takes into consideration uh, non-disjunction as a mechanism for safety, uh, those inversions and deletions actually have a safety value as well. Very good point. So essentially making balancer, balancer chromosomes. Yeah. So Jeff, that was nice. Can you elaborate on the, <clears throat> at some point you talked about the ancestral, I want to call it Orpheum, if I may, right? Sure. So are we sure that that's, so if it doesn't work, I, I guess you learn from it, but it seems to me that it's going to be really hard to find a Orpheum sequence or an Orpheum sequence that will lead to the right proteome for cells to be viable. In other words, we all have, as you mentioned yourself, uh, variants in many of these ORFs. You mentioned 10,000, I forgot exactly what that was. So in other words, can you elaborate on right. how an Orpheum is going to be a, is going to lead to a viable proteome, I guess, with all the different combinations of alleles that are in the human population. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah, so um, I would be very surprised if by making such an Orpheome, um, if we had a major impact on the viability of cells. Now, it's, it's not a completely trivial matter, of course, but virtually every variant allele in the human genome has a major allele and a minor allele. And for the most part, although there are exceptions to this, for the most part, um, those uh, major and minor alleles are shared across populations. So for, for the vast majority, you can identify the major allele rather easily, and, um, and that's, what use. that's what we would be using, and I would say from first principles, that's likely to work. Now, there are some very interesting exceptions of specific uh, non-synonymous variants that are, for example, highly enriched in Caucasians. Uh, and uh, so a de decisions would have to be made there about, you know, are we going to make, are we going to make a Caucasian or are we going to make an African genome? Uh, that's an interesting um, unresolved question that would need to be. Uh, Tackled, but I think the number of changes of that type are small enough that it would be possible to make different versions. Yeah. Hi, Jeff. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm wondering for those retro retro transposon, um, do you think they are necessary evil or they are just a parasite? So, is there any bad consequence of getting rid of them? especially considering they may be the enhancer for the nearby genes? Right. Um, very good question. So um, might those transposons be doing something good for us? Um, this is the question that always comes up at the bar at the transposon meetings, and it's been doing so ever since I entered the field. And at least with the yeast genome, we're going to have an answer to that question pretty soon. So far, we have not been able to connect uh, any essential function for living transposons. Now, there are many transposons that have died out and then been sort of pressed into service. Uh, as Sidney Brenner famously said, garbage you throw out, junk you save. So these old transposon genomes are saved and they accidentally turn into sometimes an enhancer or what have you. So it's clear that that happens, and that's why uh, it would not be wise to remove all copies of transposable element DNA from human DNA because there'd be hardly anything left. Uh, <laughs> but we would be targeting just the actively mobile ones, which presumably don't have such a function. But if they did, what an interesting thing that would be. I'd like to thank everyone for, for being here. and. Uh, I want to tell you about um, kind of our idea in terms of 1% project uh, uh, in, in this forum. Um, I'd like to just acknowledge uh, Ravi Seth, who's a graduate student in my lab, uh, who's uh, helped uh, craft this project, um, also prepare some of the slides here. And uh, really, the, the essence of this project, I think, is about um, kind of engineering metabolism or thinking about engineering metabolism in humans. And 
I'll try to motivate why this is potentially important on a, on a short end as well as a long time scale and the possible impacts for, for doing this in, in uh, both cell lines and, and potentially into uh, um, kind of whole organisms, obviously, um, not necessarily in humans, but maybe also in the context of, of other m mammals that might be relevant uh, for this. So um, as you know, y'all know, chronic uh, malnutrition is, a, is really a, a global health problem, right? And uh, basically 45% of all children under five uh, die from, uh, who, who have died are, are as a result of chronic malnutrition and really afflicts uh, underdeveloped and developing countries. And, and these lead to a variety of kind of health outcomes which are really problematic both acutely as well as chronically. Right? So the, in the absence of uh, central proteins or vitamins that are necessary during development, uh, one could lead to a, a variety of of diseases that could scar the individual uh, throughout the course of their, their lifetime. We're going to have to feed people, uh, more people in the, on, on this planet uh, in the future. And so we need to be thinking about ways for food security. The rise in, in the food demands is going to be great. And so we really need to think about transformative potential of some of the th these things. Um, and really, this, this predicates on the idea that, that food is so important for us, and we all know that's, that's the case. And we've been experimenting with food since antiquities in terms of how that contributes to health and, and, uh, and disease and, and stuff, uh, things like that. Uh, but we've actually also been experimenting with uh, how to uh, grow s human cells and, and culture in the context of uh, using spe specific media that would uh, allow us to do in vitro cell culture. Um, you need to add d d specific different types of amino acids and vitamins for cells to be able to grow in vitro. And uh, this was uh, pioneered by uh, Harry Eagle um, in the 1955, uh, kind of the, f the famous uh, Eagle media that we're all using for mammalian tissue culture. Uh, the major constituents are amino acids, vitamins, uh, sh sugars, and, and salts, but also things like uh, serum that are needed. Now, now in, in stem cells, uh, they, they actually also require things like uh, the, these types of media, but they actually have perhaps more defined minimal media that are important for keeping the stem cell state. And these are things that are emerging with regard to how we perceive or how we think about engineering stem cells in, 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 in vitro settings and, and understanding the process of differentiation and how metabolism contributes to that. Um, so, you know, as you may know, uh, humans and basically all mammals uh, lack the ability to synthesize nine essential amino acids. And so these are kind of outlined here. And then they really are uh, linked with the, essentially the cost of biosynthesis, right? So the, the more uh, steps that's required for synthesizing those different uh, amino acids, the, the basically the, the, the less likely they're able to, uh, humans are able to actually uh, synthesize them. So we're able to synthesize the, the simple amino acids, but not uh, the more complex ones. If you go backwards and say, well, what, what does that mean in, in evolutionary terms? Yeah, these, these are the non-essential amino acids that are, that are essential amino acids that can be synthesized by almost all organisms on, on the planet compared to the uh, essential amino acids, which are basically only uh, capably synthesized by plants and uh, simple unicellular organisms. So basically almost all amino acids um, that are generated on Earth are being produced by these two sources. And the entire food pyramid is uh, predicated on the consumption of those uh, essential uh, resources. And um, obviously E. coli, we've, we're all very familiar with, are able to synthesize these, uh, simple, amino acids, uh, these simple and complex amino acids as well as the, the essential vitamins from simple carbon sources. And that's, I think, the really essential key is that can we think about uh, developing a human cell lines where we can then start to uh, uh, use only carbon elemental building blocks as the food source as opposed to these um, kind of more uh, 
uh, complex uh, macromolecules. There's uh, precedence in thinking about this, right, uh, and, and even uh, implementing some of this in the, in the context of, for example, engineered rice, where they've uh, uh, incorporated uh, uh, pathways for biosynthesizing beta carotene, which is a precursor for up vitamins that uh, can improve uh, human health, and vi uh, vitamin uh, A deficiency is a really big problem in many parts of the world where. Um, that is not necessarily part of their uh, daily diet. So the, the general idea here is really to synthesize a prototrophic human genome, uh, um, and there's possibly two ways of doing that. Right? One, you, we could think about this in the context of, of human cells, uh, uh, as well as um, uh, the microbiome, which are intimately linked with our human body, as we know. And this is, uh, would be the idea would uh, be incorporating uh, pathways from bacteria and plants, uh, developing uh, the, the specific pathways that are uh, amenable for human uh, uh, cells, synthesizing them and optimizing them and inserting them into human genomes, and, and being able to test them uh, relatively easily uh, since we would just uh, be removing those particular amino acids from the media to be able to test the functionality of this. Now, we've just compiled a, a list of uh, some of these metabolic networks that might be interesting, um, and that would re really require kind of engineering metabolism on many different scales. Um, so the, the essential amino acids and fatty acids are, are potentially uh, quite interesting, as well as the, the vitamins. And obviously, there are some pathways that require many, many different steps and that are probably more challenging biosynthetically um, than others. Uh, but if you kind of add up the total number of genes that may be required, you're probably getting at something like uh, uh, north of uh, 230, 250 genes uh, to produce all the essential amino acids, fatty acids, and vitamins that are necessary to make a prototrophic cell. And uh, one of the, I think, the key advantages here also is that uh, this type of project could be parallelized, right? So people could uh, synthesize many different aspects of uh, many different uh, pathways independently in parallel and then test them in different, uh, in their own um, setups and then we can all put them together um, similar to what the yeast 2.0 project has been able to do. And uh, uh, really kind of this will also require uh, foundational technologies that are hopefully being developed through uh, this, this project. Um, uh, Things like stable integration into human cell, uh, cell lines and uh, pathway optimization, uh, as well as uh, all the other things associated with the microbiome uh, uh, manipulation. And, uh, and the kind of the practical application with regard to industry um, are that human cell lines, as well as uh, mammalian cell lines in general, are used as a major source for biopharmaceutical production. And uh, I think this is going to be quite important in terms of thinking about more defined media for those, and uh, as well as to reduce the cost of those. Other things like uh, insights to metabolism in terms of cancer development, other things I think that are going to be important. And I think the, really the long-term consequences of this is, uh, is really thinking about making things like potentially more cost-efficient in vitro uh, cultured food, um, combating malnutrition, and maybe thinking about more autotrophic uh, opportunities, maybe thinking about space explorations where nutrition is a big issue. So I'll conclude with this slide, which is that I think, you know, I, there's, I think, a, a, a really interesting opportunity here to think about engineering human metabolism by augmenting it with uh, these pathways that, for one reason or another, we lost uh, during evolution. And uh, I think, you know, this really will help us to understand the basic blueprints for life in terms of uh, what is needed to, to make a viable cell um, and, uh, and many other potential opportunities for this. So I'd love to hear your thoughts and comments and uh, critique of this idea. And so yeah, I'll take questions. Yeah. So, um, so, um, some of these micronutrients, um, they are really important. You're not overdosed. 
Um, so the problem is if you overproduce a lot of these micronutrients, that might actually end up to be um, not beneficial to the human. So how do you really control the dosage of these micronutrients? Right. So I think that's a great question. So how do we determine the right uh, kind of dosage of, of these uh, these things? And and I think that's part of the technology that hopefully would come out of this is how do we begin to set, build sensors, uh, control elements to modulate you know, these mi micronutrients, both maybe at the transcription or translation levels, that will give us uh, kind of the optimal cell growth states. So that's an open question. I think that's something that we would definitely love to consider more. Um, but. Okay. Well, well uh, maybe we'll take the questions uh, Hi, at the break. I just got a quick one for you. Um, yeah. Thanks very much for the talk. The title, Synthesizing a Human Prototrophic or a prototrophic human being is a little bit provocative because the ultimate downstream application of your thinking is that you will essentially engineer humans that will be able to make essential amino acids. And therefore, in the context of what Jeff and others are saying about the safety and the public perception of this project, I wonder if this is a great pilot to you know, convince the public. Um, yeah, so, so, so uh, that's, that's a great point. Um, well, this is a much larger discussion, so I think we'll hold that until the break where we can kind of t talk about this or later on for the discussions. Uh, thank you very much to Nancy and team for putting the meeting together, and thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Liam Holt. I'm from NYU, and I want to acknowledge Sadash and Pingley, who's here, who's been helping with this project. And I'm going to talk about a pilot project called the Seven, the Seven Signals Toolbox. OK, so we've been talking about creating these extremely modified human cells in an iPS cell line with the idea that this will derive a huge amount of benefit because we can, in principle, differentiate iPS cells into any type of human cell. And that's great in principle, but in practice, we really still don't know how to do this. And so. How are we going to make progress in figuring out how to program iPS cells? And we have to think about developmental biology for this, unfortunately. And so I used to have a big problem with developmental biology meetings because I would go and people would show me this kind of image, which is pretty, and there were blue things, and they would talk about the development of the brain, and it was all due to hedgehog. And they would talk about the development of the limbs, and that was hedgehog, or maybe sonic hedgehog. And the heart was hedgehog. And this is frustrating and confusing to me. But then as I became more aware of this, this whole area, it became extremely exciting. Because the question becomes, how is it that a small number of pathways, of modules, are employed in combination to give the massive variation of human cells and tissues? So it turns out that in the evolution of animals, there are really only seven main developmental signaling pathways listed here, with a notable eighth, which is hippo. And so the, the problem is, how do we use these to make a defined cell? How do we go from a single embryo, embryonic cell and then differentiate this into the heart, the liver, the lungs? And People have been thinking about this for a long time, and they think about it in a couple of different ways. So one way you could think about it is that there are these gradients of growth factors. These are the things that put the input into these seven signaling pathways throughout the three-dimensional space of an embryo, such that at a particular concentration of Wnt and TGF beta signaling, you might get the heart right here. But it's not a static thing. And if you look at this movie, that uh, you can really see that. So here we have these cells that are migrating along the length of a fish embryo um, up a wind gradient. And so these cells right here are experiencing in time a variation in the concentration of the inputs to these seven pathways. So really, the problem boils down to if I can give a cell the correct temporal sequence of these seven signaling pathways, then I can make the cell type that I want. And people have made really good progress in this area. So that's exactly what people have been doing. You take your iPS cell, and you put in some growth factor, and you shake it around for a few days, and then you put in another one. 
And eventually, people have made these incredible organoids, which you'll hear more about. For example, intestinal or even the, the retina, or little organoids that have quite um, amazing function. And this shows the promise of the field. Um, but unfortunately, we have only explored a very small part of the possible space um, to create everything that we need ultimately. And these, these methods are still quite inefficient and quite imprecise. So the limitations to these um, current approaches, one is that the signaling space is huge. And so to try and find the correct place in the signaling space where people are trying to use developmental biology as a guide, but our understanding of development is still incomplete. So what people are trying to do typically is they are searching um, in this tree. So we, all of these pathways, they have a tree-like structure where at the top we have the growth factors and the receptors for those growth factors. I mean, these are like the branches of the tree. And uh, what a lot of people are trying to do is find the right combination of growth factors uh, of which there are hundreds. And so they're looking at this combinatorial space, which is 100 dimensional. And other people are trying to drive transcription factors that drive the ultimate cell output at the bottom of these signaling pathways. And again, there are hundreds of possible combinations. And what we propose in this pilot project is instead to focus on the central transduction part of the signaling pathway. So all of these seven pathways go through a constriction point, which is the most evolutionarily conserved part of the pathway that typically only involves one or two proteins. For example, for Wnt, this is a single beta-catenin molecule. So our approach will be to create synthetic control at these pathway constri constriction points. So the general approach is to create a dominant active allele of all of these seven constriction points and hook them up to orthogonal control. And orthogonal control, there are many ways you could think about this. Two modular simple examples, uh, we can take these ligand binding domains, these hormone binding domains, that in the absence of the hormone are unstable and degrade our active allele. And if we add a hormone, then they become stabilized. So now we can use a hormone, even a hormone from a plant, like a plant steroid. And George and David Baker's group have worked on this and control cells that way. Another way is to use optogenetics. We can take these plant proteins that dimerize or break apart, depending on where the light is present, and we can hook those up to our alleles of choice. And in this way, we sequester our allele on a membrane and then release it when we want it to be active using infrared light. So the HTP Wright project is a good reason for, for trying to generate this technology. It will enable the use of the HTP Wright cells, but it also enables the execution of this project. So we could imagine making a synthetic development locus where we put all seven um, signaling pathways, the orthogonal signaling pathways in a locus, and we can put these in cells and study them that way. So in conclusion, we believe that the bottlenecks of these pathways are an opportunity for synthetic biology to accelerate stem cell discovery. And with that, I'll take any questions. All right, if there are no further questions. Oh, one from George. One quick one. If, if you, consider the, you consider the binary, uh, if so, there's like two to the seventh or eighth possible combinations, or is it uh, a more quantitative? Is it binary or is it more quantitative code? So George's question is whether the, these are just pairwise interactions that we have to consider, or is it more um, multiplex than that? And I would say that we don't know. It's almost certainly not just binary but the degree of complexity, the number of temporal steps that define iPS cell to any given cell types, I, I think we still don't know the answer to those questions, but it's, it's not gonna be as simple as just binary, and therefore that further motivates the, the idea of simplifying the problem. All right, thanks.